Hey guys, this is Elise. I'm a licensed professional counselor, a wellness coach. Welcome back to COVID-19 Mental Health Chats. Today, I have the pleasure to introduce a good friend of mine, Dr. Joy Walton, who is a Christian physician on the front lines treating and fighting COVID-19 in Central Ohio. She has worked as a physician for 13 years, giving back to Ohioans in this home state that she was born and raised in. And for this particular interview, I have a long intro to give you all about her and how special she is to me and to this journey of healing from coronavirus as a community. Joy was ahead of the curve in awareness for the Midwestern community in the U.S. She channeled her awareness into action by creating a, fo a forum on Facebook with her sisters called COVID-19 for Healthcare Workers. That went viral and now has around 300,000 healthcare worker members from all over the US and even from other parts of the world. The purpose of that group is to be a think space where healthcare workers can share boots on the ground and treatment information with one another regarding this novel virus. Every day there is new information and new hypotheses that emerge along with new symptoms tied to COVID-19. Early on, she asked me to join her admin team for the group, which I felt compelled and convicted to share mental health information for because I saw early warning signs from the end of March that there could be a wave of trauma and other mental health issues suffered by people due to the impact of the virus. And that's what inspired a project like this channel to share information with you guys. All right. So as is the usual spirit and intention of this channel to give you free practical information on steps you can either use to reframe your mind for optimal functioning or skills you can use behaviorally towards a better quality of life, this interview will zoom in on what Joy has to share for you to be helped on the topics of adjustment during coronavirus, the question of how to find God in this situation, and how to stand firm in your faith or your foundation if you are a Christian. And as my friend, Joy is so kind to share from both her mind and her heart as a Christian physician, wife, and mother. Thanks, Joy, for being with me here today for this conversation. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Joy, so um, my, my first question this evening is, I would love to hear from you a bit of what your journey was in learning about, realizing, adjusting to the coronavirus as a person and as a physician in Ohio. Thanks, Elise. Thank you for those kind words. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think that my journey um, was a lot like others in the medical community. Um, there were some parts of it that maybe were a little different. Um, so I was a lot like everyone else in the medical community. We were all taken by surprise. Um, we were all kind of caught unawares. Um, I happened to have just amazing family uh, members, and I happened to have um, three younger sisters, one of who, whom was very um, serious in taking the COVID-19 um, pandemic seriously. Mm. And, you know, she was really the one who um, caused me to pivot and caused me to take a, take a deep dive into COVID-19 when I hadn't been taking it seriously. I think I was like the rest of the medical community. And I'd even talked to some of my infectious disease colleagues and said, hey, what do you think about this? These people were starting to ask things, you know, should we go on this spring break? Should we not? You know, and so I was calling them and asking them what they thought. And, you know, they, they gave me what they what they knew at the time, which was like, you know, you know, probably avoid the airport, but it's, it's not so much to worry about, you know, we, we're not too concerned. There's too much hysteria, et cetera, et cetera. So I actually got into an argument with this sister of mine because I felt very, I, I felt like she was, you know, blowing, you know, blowing things out of proportion. And, you know, I saw behaviors that I was very critical of, um, such as starting to sort of build a bunker in their basement. And, you know, I was very, very, critical and we actually ended up having an argument and it was you know um sorry my oh it's okay yes you're hungry well you had pizza i'm in my candy you can eat one piece of candy okay choose one piece and then don't come in did you paint your nails yeah oh you did yeah. do you want to show miss elise do you want to show her your nails <gasps> Okay, pick one piece of candy and then you need to leave the door shut. 
Okay, one piece. Just one piece. This is our treasure trove here. Ooh. Right. Okay, one piece, please. Yes. Okay, chocolate. Okay, that's a good choice. Okay, now then you're going to close the door. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Say bye, Miss Lee. Bye. <laughs> oh, she's so precious. <laughs> Uh, I give her the worst haircut in history, and she loves it. She is so cute. <laughs> She's All like right, your mini me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry about that. <laughs> it's okay. That was so cute. It was the perfect little break. Um, <laughs> you were sharing about um, um, family. So, you know, your daughter yeah. made the perfect cameo because you were talking about family and... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so just go ahead and start. I'll just keep going. Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I, you know, I had gotten into kind of a heated argument with my first sister and um, was very critical and just came from a place of, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. You're not even, you know, you're not a physician. You're not in the medical community and nobody in our medical community is talking about this. And, you know, boy, uh, she was just, she showed me so much grace and and basically, she, you know, we, we made up and she said, look, just take some time and, and, and look into it. See what you think, you know? And, and so I did through a private physician only Facebook group, the wonders of social media. Um, I kind of did a deep dive and basically for like the next 48 hours, we did a deep, deep dive and found out through a private physician feed that was getting information from boots on the ground in Seattle and Italy and, and the West coast saying, Hey, this is real. You guys get ready. This is, we're dealing with it. We're, we're in the trenches and it's terrible. Please, please do what you can and start, start getting prepared now. Mm -hmm. You know? And so, I mean, it took a while for that to sink in. It did not sink in right away. And so, but, um, essentially by, uh, by the second week of March, I had made a complete pivot. And you know, and that, that was hard. It was, it's humble. It's hard as a physician who feel, you know, you, to feel like you were taken completely by surprise and you um, maybe even misled people, you know, it just really was a moment that um, I had to say, okay, like I'm going to swallow my pride. This is so much bigger than me. This is serious. You know, and again, credit to my sister for, for helping me pivot in that way through just kind of this humility, this just attitude of humility. So that's, that's kind of how I first began, um, my journey. Mm, wow. Thank you so much. I'm hearing that there are so many moving pieces and you had to pivot many times that members of your family had to as well and adjust, um, and how shocking it is to find information, not from within the medical community, but kind of outside, just in the community right. um, at large. So I'm curious, how was it for you to adjust um, kind of in some ways alone because you, you knew certain things and you were hearing certain things through other connections, your colleagues, your friends, your very close friends who are also physicians um, who were hearing similar things, but then others who were not yet up to date with similar news and and then in your family system as a sister to adjust you know as a as a member of the family a daughter a wife a mother and a family relative um how were how was how did it feel for you to have to adjust so many times and, and constantly yeah it, it was um it didn't feel good <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was very, uh, yeah it was it was um it was easily the most alone and the most terrified I've ever felt in my entire life, you know, and, um, it, you know, it, it, um, I, I felt an incredible sense of responsibility knowing what I, what I had learned again, not really because I was any smarter than anybody else, but just because I started paying attention a little bit earlier. Um, but that was an incredibly isolating feeling and it was incredibly, um, heavy feeling of just, okay, I've got to do everything I can to just raise the, sound the alarm. And, you know, um, one of my son's teachers likened it to feeling like John the Baptist, like, <laughs> like a voice in the wilderness, but feeling like I was looked at, like I had three heads. You know, I can remember, um, it started small. Like, uh, I wrote some dates down on March 11th. I privately decided after speaking with my husband, um, to pull my kids out of school. And I was, absolutely the, you know, the only one doing that at the time. Um, 
uh, that same day I canceled our spring break plans. That same day I also canceled um, my daughter's checkup at her, uh, her three-year-old checkup with her pediatrician. Mm. Uh, I canceled our music lessons. I canceled a bunch of uh, play dates that we had. Um, and um, I remember uh, then the next day I was sitting in a, um, among some colleagues and there were about 20 of us there and sort of, you know, nobody's wearing masks or anything. We're just sitting there and at a presentation. And I remember saying something like, you know, should we even be here right now? Should we even be sitting in this room and sort of, you know, getting like laughs in the room and, and nobody was, you know, unkind, but just kind of feeling like, uh, embarrassed and silly for saying that. Mm -hmm. um, and then literally that afternoon, DeWine, um, our governor, um, announcing the three-week spring break, um, extended spring break for schools, um, and uh, announcing the less 100 assemblies. Um, the following day on Friday the 13th, I was the first person to cancel my pediatric clinic. You know, and I remember mm -hmm. uh, talking to my medical director, and, and he was super understanding and super kind, but clearly, you know, sort of reading between the lines, he was like, okay, so why are you doing that again? Why, you know, and I said, well, I'll call my patients. I'll call them over the phone. At that point, there was no telemedicine, you know? And right. sort of like, and him being like, okay, well, you know, I mean, he was supportive, but it was, you know, I was the first person to do that. And it was, so it was very isolating. And I felt, you know, kind of a little crazy <laughs> to be honest, but I mm. felt like I had to do those things, you know? And so as I, started to raise the alarm. Um, that's when the Facebook group got um, kicked off through the help of my mm -hmm. second sister who was pregnant at the time. It was helping me kind of feed some of the information and cross post from some of the private physician groups. I wanted to make that information available to all healthcare workers in the community. Um, and so that's kind of how that got started. But I'll tell you at least, I, um, I went to a very dark place. I went to a place that I have never been um, and, you know, this is trying to be sensitive to those with mental health issues, but I have not ever personally struggled with any mental health um, issues that have been diagnosed. And mm. I, um, I absolutely went to a place where I could not get myself out of. I stopped eating. I stopped drinking. I mean, mm. I could feel the dehydration in my body. Um, mm. I, I, I didn't sleep for an entire week. Um, I stayed in one spot in my basement. I'd essentially completely quarantined myself away from my family. And I remember my husband walking in and just being like, you have not, you know, he put down food there for me and I, I wouldn't have touched it for 12 hours. And I, he, you know, I was in the exact same position um, that I'd been, you know, 12 hours earlier, just mm -hmm. reading everything, just devouring it, trying to, trying to spread the word. And so I, um, the fear and the anxiety that terrorized my body was, physical was it was it was very real and I I I mean it got to a point where you know um my my husband my family um a few concerned friends um and colleagues had to actually intervene and and um you know and say hey like are you okay because we are concerned we are concerned for you and I'm thankful that they did that yeah it's so understandable that you went to, um, that you were really doing the best you could. And it sounds to me like you were having some normal responses to a very abnormal situation. You know, once you go through your training as a physician, you're not really prompted to think that you're going to go through another medical school type system or situation where you're totally new to everything. And it's yeah. all novel to you and nobody, and, and then especially to be in a situation where it feels like everyone's going through medical school again, yeah. where like nobody really has any answers right. um, at right. the end of each day, um, except for another hypothesis or a strengthened hypothesis. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, it's just so understandable that everyone may have been even in different places at different points. Um, and constantly in different places to right. kind of move like a wave within the family system of, of healthcare workers and then within the family system at home too. And, and that can feel so unsettling at times and even okay at other times. Um, yeah, I love that analogy because that wave analogy is perfect because, but I didn't I didn't, I couldn't appreciate that being mm. kind of in the first wave. I, I, I could only see what was not happening at the time. Mm. 
which right. was not a lot was happening. You know, I remember being at a system wide meeting and and uh, one of the leaders saying, well, we don't need to cancel elective surgeries right now. We're not at that, you know, and inside me screaming, like, yes, we do. We needed to do it a long time ago. Let's do it now. You know, and, mm -hmm. you know, um, it, uh, feeling this sense of um, such unregulated anxiety and such unregulated fear. It was just unbridled fear um, that I, I really became a very ineffective communicator. I really, um, I wasn't able to, um, you know, really communicate messages that needed to be communicated because all they could hear was the tone in my voice that you mm -hmm. know <laughs> probably the pressured speech and sort of the anger and sort of the like why what are you waiting for let's do this now and this needs to be done now and this needs to be done now this should have been done last week and mm -hmm. and so i i really in some ways i really deeply regret some of the things the ways that i communicated and wish that i wouldn't have um wouldn't have been so quick to um to you know be upset even though i appreciate you kind of normalizing my fear you know mm -hmm. and um and understanding that you know it felt patronizing when somebody would say you know why are you being so intense about this you need to like cool down you know and be like mm -hmm. it, it, fe it felt you know it felt patronizing because uh because uh, i felt like the fear was legitimate and it was um so but i appreciate that because you know i could see that wave happening you know in my medical community as people caught on as my leaders caught on um everybody started to get on the same page it just took it took a little bit of time and i was impatient and and so i i have really um i have regretted that in so many ways um i'll give you one example which is you know the first day i came to work kind of in the you know kind of recognized covid situation was still fairly early on it was i think the last week of march or so and so i was the only one wearing a mask um mm. and i was handing them out to the janitor and to the cook and <laughs> to the nurses and you know and my colleagues I was having you know pretty intense conversations with you know trying to really help them to understand and so um and I got you know I got um you know I got reported um yeah. uh, by just everybody left and right um and all the way to the top and so you know, of course, my response was just like, you know, this is wrong. Like, I shouldn't be crucified for this. I should be, you know, this, this is, this is, I'm trying, I'm trying to be helpful here. Um, and instead, I, I made a lot of enemies in a sense. Um, and, but as the waves went on, as time went on, as leadership caught up, um, you know, everybody, I realized everybody was just doing the best they could. Right, you don't know what you don't know, um, and and so it took some time. So it's <laughs> it's not always beneficial to be in the first wave, I guess. <laughs> but I, I I appreciate what you you said just uh, moments ago, and and um, I, I did ultimately, you know, just being fully transparent here, I did end up um, being mandated to see a psychiatrist um, for. Uh, um, physicians and, and providers and it ended up being a wonderful thing um and i'm so happy i did but it did in that moment felt um a little bit like a move on leadership's part to silence me um because i was s sort of seen as um an insider of panic and 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 now i can see that right i can appreciate that now here i am handing out masks but i didn't necessarily have enough masks for every single person in the hospital or in the entire system you know that mm -hmm. i work work for and mm -hmm. so and leadership had been told that we don't, that's not what we're doing right now mm -hmm. um and so that's where the the conflict came in right and mm -hmm. um so it it felt like i was fighting a lot of a lot of different battles on many different fronts and that ended up being very divisive and it sort of in a way it it tore down at the purpose of being focused on our just our one enemy COVID-19. So I have some mm. regrets about that. Um, and I learned a lot about myself and I learned a lot about, you know, how things work in a big health system, you know, when you're just one voice. And and that's not to say that one voice can't make a difference because you can, you can. Mm. And eventually, you know, and people heard me and not just me, but other voices too. Um, mm. It just took, it took some time. Um, and that's mm. true too, the wave phenomenon, that's true of my family. like my husband and I, we've been married for 12 years and he was on a day, he was on his own wave too, you know, and we were having uh, 
pretty intense arguments at home about, you know, what to do when he went outside with the dog, you know, and, you know, and it wasn't effective when I would scream at him and say, you need to be wearing your mask, you know, and he'd be like, well, just explain to me why I don't get it, you know, or when we would kind of go walks on with our children and things like that and walks with our children. And, and so just things like that. And I realized that everybody was on um, a different wave. And so the, the grace you have to give to others um, in that, and, and also the education and the knowledge, because that's empowering, um, mm. but reacting can be very um, counterproductive. <laughs> oh, wow. Joy, I just, I want to, so this part, <laughs> I guess I should say, because, you know, we're, we're doing a recorded interview, in addition to being able to talk because we're friends, this part is, um, it's unscripted. None of it is planned out, so I just want, I just want to, uh, to, to share that out loud people who are going to end up listening to this. And, and at the same time, um, I just want to thank you so much because as a friend, um, that's a huge amount of trust that you're sharing that with me to that amount of detail and about your experience in yeah. the system, um, how it feels to work on the team, to be ahead of the curve be, be, before most of the medical community in our, in our locale. And the medical community, of course, is ahead of the rest of the community. And so um, to have to bear in patience and humility, to, to have the humility to even share like, hey, this is what happened for me. And um, I needed some professional support. I needed people to watch out for my best interest, for my own well-being. And it turned out to be really good. And yeah. it's okay to do this. There's like nothing wrong with it. You know, like all these pieces that you're sharing right now is so valuable for so many people to hear that wherever they are in this process is okay. And wherever, you know, the rest of the people around them are is okay too. Like we're all part of the wave and we're in, we're not in a wave like we're, um, like victims of the wave, but we're, we're just processing at different levels and different yeah. speeds. And, yes. um, I just really appreciate, uh, you know, first and foremost, as your friend that you're sharing that. And, and then secondly, just how willing you are to share something, you know, to self disclose in yeah. hopes that it could help someone else too. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, you know, I want to say one thing just to you, this doesn't have to go on the recording, which is I, you know, I remember you trying to really reach out to me and it was right around, it was that weekend that, uh, what had happened was a patient had come in with suspected COVID and our mm. hospital was completely unprepared and just the ER physician didn't even, it didn't even cross her mind. She was like, what's COVID? Right. Um, and he was the same age as my husband. Mm -hmm. And I, at that point, that was my break. That's the point at which I, I went to a complete, like I, I just completely shut down. And I think around that time, you and Mary and you know, Karis, you guys were just really like trying to come to support me. And you were realizing like what was going on with the PPE and the exposures that were happening in the hospital. And I think I was so just, I was so, I felt kind of traumatized and I just felt like, and then, then I felt because I was being reported um, yeah. by my VPMA, basically the top of my hospital, um, mm. that any move I made, I would be fired on the spot. Um, and I didn't want to be out of the game. It wasn't that I was afraid of being fired. It was mm. that I wanted to be part of this fight mm. and she took away my license then I wouldn't be able to fight. Um, and so that was one of my greatest fears at the time. And I, it's, you know, and, and it's another regret though, too, because I think I should have spoken up. I think, I, I, I think, cause obviously clearly later people did and on their own volition. Um, but at the time that was really my greatest fear was that I, um, I had released a letter to my neighborhood and that kind of got shared widely and people were people that I had no idea were telling me that they had received the letter. And in it, I had re referenced very loosely, not violating HIPAA rules, but referenced a couple patients um, in, in that had been seen the night before. And so, mm. you know, there were a lot of like threats coming, not threats, threats is a strong word, like a lot of just like tips coming from my medical director, from friends and colleagues who were like, hey, you gotta, you gotta watch out, you gotta watch out, you're, you're gonna be like, they're gonna, they're gonna get you for that. You know, and so there was a lot of, just a lot of fear. And so anyways, I just say that because I, I know, I understood your intention in doing that. And I, I wish that I sort of had the, you know, mental fortitude to be able to say yes, but I just couldn't in that situation. So oh, it's okay. No, not at all. Yes, dear. 
I'm normally hungry again. Go <laughs> check that. Go check that. Lights on. Lights on. Okay, go check it. Open on this one, man. Side. Man side. Okay. All right. Bye bye. So, anyways, <laughs> yeah, I think it, I, I, the, the timeline is still a little blurry in my head because it was. Um, I need to like today was actually the first day that I like wrote things down. I used my Facebook to kind of remember what day things happened, um, and so I know somewhere around there early on you had reached out. Um, but anyways, oh well, that's what a friend is for, and I think you know in these times. Um, we're really, we, we're like so much good is coming out of the woodwork, yes. really. You know, everyone yeah. in the community is getting creative, stepping up, helping each other, and, and then also reaching inside. So um, that kind of segues to my next question. As all these things are happening and moving and, and um, it's easy for anyone to, to fall off their foundation, to feel like their foundation is shaky and... Um, it's not, I feel like my, my question is not super well formed. So <laughs> let me ask it and then you can, and then you can answer how, however way you feel. Four. Yeah, we're kind of in between three and four. Three and so four. like, as things are moving, where did you go to find security and peace of mind in all of this? How did you find God in the midst of what was happening? Um, and as your foundation is tested as a physician, as a, as a person in what we thought was a secure world. Um, and all, by giving attention to that foundation, you, you made your foundation stronger and you came out of that, that whole process of what you described earlier. Um, so I'm curious, how did you, how did you find your two feet back on, on the ground in your foundation? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, really the short answer is, um, the grace of God and the word of God. Um, I, I did, you know, things kind of, um, escalated to a point where I was almost, I'd say maybe in a semi, not a psychiatrist, but maybe a semi catatonic state where I was, um, I had locked myself in my room. Um, and I, time sort of lost time. There wasn't a sense of time. I remember it was raining and I was staring. I had this window sort of right above my, um, that it's kind of like a skylight. And I remember the rain was coming down and I was just watching the rain fall on the window. And that was like a very comforting thing. Um, and I remember like at some point, you know, I just sort of, I hadn't slept at that point in a week or so. And my husband walked in and I said, what time is it? And I forget what he said, but I said, how long have I been laying here? He said eight hours. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so just, so in my mind, this is what's going on in my mind. You know, I, you know, I work in a small hospital with an open ICU. So generally, even though we have critical care backup and anesthesiology backup in that moment, at that time, this is early in COVID, um, mm. It was. It would have been me. I, I would have been the person to do all of the things um, in terms of the high risk aerosolized procedures, and that has completely shifted. Um, but at the time, you know, I'm thinking I'm that person. Uh, I don't have the PPE. They hadn't even tested me for an N95. When I got tested for an N95, I, I failed my N95. So mm -hmm. then I needed a papper. No one could find me a papper. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my colleagues were being exposed left and right. We were sort of, you know, cases were happening left and right. And, and, and you know, we weren't, we didn't have processes in place. There wasn't clinical guidance in place. None of those things were in place right at the time, again, mm -hmm. early in the process. And so in my mind, as I'm kind of in this state in my room and thinking through, I'm thinking about, you know, my, my three children growing up potentially without a mom, you know, you're hearing about all these doctors and nurses um, falling ill and even dying. Um, and I'm thinking about what it would be like to have my husband be a widow. I'm thinking about, you know, mm -hmm. my elderly parents. I'm thinking about uh, my sister who was about to give birth, you know, um, and when I walked through the hospital where she was going to give birth, nobody was wearing a mask. You know, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about um, my brother-in-law in New York city and thinking about, um, uh, uh, my mother-in-law who's still shopping. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> all these thoughts are going through my mind and I'm processing this and I can't, I cannot even muster a prayer. I could not even 
pray, you know, and mm. I've been a confessing Christian for, for a long time. I was baptized when I was 18 and, and, you know, so I'll be 38 here in a couple, in a few days. So what's that? 20 years, you know, and I could not pray. I couldn't even pray. I couldn't mm. think of the words that nothing that would come to my mind. And so in that moment and somewhere in that hour, I started reciting Psalm 23. Mm. And the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not. And I just, as I was reciting it just over and over, you know, it, it became so it, just different. The words were so much more meaningful. You know, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. It took on a completely different life. And as I started, I would just, I, I lost count of how many times I recited. I think at least 20 or 30 times till I finally yeah. fell asleep. And when I woke up, I think the next morning, I just had this, this peace that I could not describe to you of something I've never felt before, never experienced. And I, 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 I felt as I had just been like saturated. I'd taken a bath in like the words of God in, in scripture and, and through scripture, um, this peace just, just became so real. And it wasn't that I wasn't afraid. It wasn't that I still didn't have fear and anxiety, but it was like, Somehow I, I, I just, I don't know. God gave me courage. He gave me peace. Uh, I started memorizing scripture the next day. Alexa, I was like, Alexa, Philippians four. You know, she recited it to me <laughs> all day long. Alexa, you know, Ephesians six, which talks about putting on the full armor of God. Philippians four talks a lot of, about um, the peace of God, which um, surpasses all understanding and what to set our minds on, whatever's right, whatever is true, whatever's admirable. Um, uh, you know, Psalm 94, when anxiety is great within me, your consolation brings me joy. Psalm 67, you know, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Job, who said, you know, even though you slay me, yet will I trust in you. Those verses just took on such new meaning. I mean, they're just so real. And mm. I, I just, when you talk about my two feet standing again, that's what it was. It was standing mm. on the rock of God's word. And that's, that's all I can say. There was nothing else, you know, and I, <laughs> there was this funny moment where my husband, when I finally gotten up and my husband just, um, went to embrace me and mm. he, you know, was trying in his very, very best way, just bless his heart. He's not a very like verbal person. So for him to be like, I just want to let you know that I was like, stop, stop. <laughs> recite Psalm 23 to me. <laughs> I just like cut him off. And I was like, no words, no human words, no human <laughs> the words of God. And so I made, he was like, I don't, I don't have it memorized. I was like, okay, I'll get, I'll feed it to you. And then you say it back to me. <laughs> and then, like, by the fourth time he had it memorized, he's literally just reciting it to me. And it just washed over me. And it, with it came this amazing piece. Mm, that is so beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that you know, um, especially vulnerable journey in that spiritual space for you. And um, I'm just so glad that you were able to find your foundation again in the midst of everything else around you shaking. Um, how would you encourage others to either reframe their minds or approach the situation with an openness to God or their higher power to partner with them and um, the community through this journey? Yeah, that reframing is kind of a, a new term for me. So, you know, I guess maybe talk about it from your perspective, what exactly it means. I'm not going to pretend that I know exactly what that means. <laughs> sure. <laughs> oh, you're so sweet. I hope you don't mind. I'm just going to take a minute to tell Alexa, lights on. Sorry, it just keeps turning off. <laughs> Um, so reframing is, um, it, it's kind of like what it sounds like. We're just applying a new shape of a frame or a size of a frame to um, our perspective. And um, that could be by considering a, a question, or it could be by considering a different variable, or um, even just like throwing in another color to the whole situation. So what, whatever that is, it, it, the variable that makes the reframe happen, it could be anything. So if okay. you were to, um, you know, when, when thinking about just, it, you don't have to worry about it being like a mental health, whatever okay. type of practical step. Okay. <laughs> Cause, um, you know, the fact that you're ahead of the curve and that you've gone through all this internally and are coming out so strong, so positive, so like united with your team, with yourself, with your higher power. And you're just, you're like, 
all like all steam ahead. And, um, you know, so for others to also find that place of strength within themselves, um, what, what would you suggest has worked for you that, that can work for others too, to, to find themselves also back on two feet on, on solid ground? Hmm. Okay. Um, a couple things come to mind and, and I don't know if this exactly answers the question, but two things that happened to me were, um, one, my baby nephew was born. He was born on March 24th. So, um, and when my sister, uh, went to go deliver, you know, she was of course with me in the very early stages. So, um, and she's not in the medical field, but, you know, I basically explained to her, you need to be wearing a mask when you go and deliver and you have to be prepared that nobody else is going to be. And she, and, and she and her husband, you know, were definitely the only ones, none of the nurses were, you know, the whole bit. And so, you know, um, they had their sweet, uh, baby boy and, you know, very close to the sister. And I was supposed to be like her person because her husband, um, passes out easily. (laughs) And so I was going to be like the person that was there. And so it broke my heart that I couldn't be there. Um, but Mm. when she brought her baby boy home, um, and his name is Noah and Noah means rest, um, and peace and comfort. I remember just sitting down and being kind of inspired by that and thinking about him as a baby. Um, and it was taking, Taking me back to eight years ago when I brought my first baby boy home and I was like, are the feds going to come out and take this baby from me? Cause I don't know what I'm doing. Like, you know, I should be arrested <laughs> right now. They shouldn't let me walk out of the hospital with this baby, you know, and just being like completely <laughs> just blown away. Like this human fragile life is in my hands and being just struck with fear. Like again, terrorized with fear. Mm-hmm. Um, that I was going to do something wrong. I wasn't going to do it right. You know? And I remember a very distinct moment when I, I had my hand on his chest and I felt his sweet little heart beating 120 times um, per minute. And as I went to lay him down, just very clearly felt the Lord like impress upon me, like you, you know, you're doing, you're, you're the mama, you're doing the best you can, but are you doing that? Are you doing that? Do you have anything to do with that? Do you have (laughs) anything to do with this breast milk coming out of your body and, providing a hundred percent of his nutritional needs. Do you have anything to do with the fact that he's growing, that he, that his kidneys and his livers are perfusing, that his brain is developing, you know, when you do those precious few hours that you do fall asleep, who watches him, you know? And so that, those moments for me were very, very pivotal in my kind of, as a first time mom, realizing that God was caring for my child. It didn't mean that I could do the best that I could, but he was going to be faithful and he was going to watch over my child better than I could. And so in going back to Noah and my nephew and thinking about him, you know, in that moment of fear and anxiety, as I was thinking about COVID-19, you know, I, I was like, you know, the world, the b- babies are going to keep being born. And, <laughs> and guess what? They're, you know, many of them, like my sweet nephew, are going to come out beautiful and breathing and, you know, and hearts beating. And, and I'm not going to have anything to do with that. And the medical system doesn't have anything to do with that. Like that was life that was knit in the womb and God preserved, you know? So that has been, that reframing really brought me peace. That was like the end of March. I remember kind of um, writing a poem and feeling really inspired by that. Um, The second thing that happened was Good Friday happened. And Good Friday for me has always been, um, almost more than Easter, um, for me been a very, very special um, day, I think for all Christians. But uh, for me, that's always been, you know, something that I have always treasured. I love Good Friday services. And of course, that Good Friday, this past Good Friday, there really weren't actually very many Good Fridays services going on at all. Most people just were doing the Easter online and and most churches had skipped Good Friday. Well, for some reason, I found a church that was doing a Good Friday service and, you know, uh, a lady did a narration of um, Mary as the mother of Jesus. And it was a beautiful portrayal as she was talking about seeing her son, you know, who was also once a little baby in her arms, up on the cross, being mocked, being spit on, being beaten, um, and, um, and being speared, nailed speared, and then, you know, and then ultimately dying. And, and for me, that moment reframed a lot of the betrayal and the mockery and kind of the isolation and the, um, you know, cause Jesus knew all that was ahead of him and like the weight of that, you know, 
and then walking towards that, walking towards Calvary, walking towards the cross, like in spite of all that and knowing that his 12 closest friends would just run away and abandon him and one would betray him. Like that for me, that Good Friday was, it, it was a real reframing moment for me because I, I was, you know, for the first time I was like, you know, um, just brokenhearted thinking about Christ on the cross and the thousand degrees more. Uh, if I felt any betrayal, if I felt any loneliness, if I felt fear and anxiety about what was to come, Christ felt it so much more. And yet he still went there and he was abandoned by his father on the cross. Whereas me, I've never had to feel that I felt alone, but I never was alone. And so those are two really big reframing moments for me. Wow. Thank you so much for that. I think those are some really accessible things that people can um, tap into. The story of um, Christ's suffering and God's love. Um, and then for, for those who don't have a personal relationship with Christ, that's still a, a story of a higher power who um, is available yes. and is available in this time for anyone to consider at least the life story of, to think of. Um, how, how suffering can be handled and, and walked through. So um, thank you so much. I, I think for my last question, um, and I, I just, I really just value you as a person. I value your voice. Um, and so I, I want to make sure we have the space to, to ask if you have any message that you would like to share in closing um, with others in this time, whether it's a practical suggestion or, or not, whatever thing that you would want to share, what would that message be? Oh, let's see here. I think the main thing on my mind has been the idea of unity. Um, and that was something early on that I felt, um, I woken up one morning thinking that I would had a conversation with my parents. Um, and so I remember texting them that morning and being like, did, mom, did you, what were you talking about when you said one, 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 who is one, one, one. And she was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I was like, dad, what did, what did you, he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. So I realized <laughs> it was a dream. I woke up and, um, and in that dream, it was just a very clear one, one, one. And as I just started to meditate on that, it sort of became crystallized. And that was the idea of one enemy, one heart and one purpose. And, you know, the one enemy thing, COVID-19 being the enemy, that was something that I personally really struggled with because as I mentioned earlier, I felt like I was fighting a lot of different battles early on. It was the battle kind of against the public, the public that's hoarding the toilet paper, the public that's, you know, not taking the social distancing seriously, the public that thinks there's, there's, um, this is a hoax. Even now, you know, um, the protesters and things like that, that it, it is, it's demoralizing as a healthcare worker to, to see that. Um, and so, uh, you know, there was that, there was that battle. And then, you know, uh, and then there was the battle once I got into the hospital of feeling like my leadership wasn't where, where I wanted them to be and getting frustrated with that. And then, you know, you had nurses fighting against doctors because the nurses have to go in and see these patients and the doctors get to just kind of sit out and they're told that they don't need to expose themselves. Like you can see where that would create such divide. Um, emergency medicine and hospital medicine, I'm a hospitalist, you know, have traditionally always had a little bit of a, a tense relationship, um, you know, and so ER wants to admit this patient and know where are the hospitals. We don't want them to come into the hospital. And, you know, and so that, that, that kind of division there, um, you know, I think politically we've seen so many divides, um, as well. And so I think the idea of one enemy is really, um, something to really, to really think on as we think about, you know, even as we're moving forward here now, talking about reopening and different phases, um, state by state, like there's, there's a lot of contention, you know, and I've seen everything from wanting to blame it on Fox News to, you know, CDC to um, this governor or that governor or that, uh, you know, and everyone has their point of view. And, and, you know, I get that. And so, you know, but if we can have one laser focus on our one enemy, then in a sense, we can, we can kind of come together instead of fighting kind of these other battles. Um, and so, and then the one heart comes from just the idea of really being others oriented and, and thinking about 
um, others' point of view. And I think it's easy to get very fired up, you know, as a healthcare worker about our, what about our PPE? What about our exposures? What about the sacrifices? What about, you know, all of these things? And then kind of, you know, forget that, gosh, there are people who are, you know, have made incredible sacrifices economically and, you know, people who are suffering from non-COVID complications um, and, and, and so many other, so many other uh, points of view that we easily sort of say, well, my, my point of view or where I'm suffering or my community suffering is this. And then again, we, we sort of, we start fighting against each other instead of being unified. If we're others oriented, we'll say, wait a minute. Okay. So, you know, for example, I'll give an early example of, I, I felt very, I was offended early on by the folks who were saying that they were bored at home and were saying that, you know, what are they going to do with the stay at home order? You know? And I remember just being enraged and thinking like, how could you, what, you know, how could, could you at least do something, you know? Um, and then, as I've shifted, as I started to see like, wait, I have to have grace for these, for everyone, you know? Um, and because God has had grace on me and others have had grace for me as well. And so, you know, um, kind of going back to reframing sort of, instead of saying, well, don't be so, you know, trying to be um, negative about it, sort of reframing things and saying, you know, it, it must be hard. It's hard for those who are working and it's hard for those who are not working. And we're all going through this together and we're kind of all struggling in our own way, you know, reframing things that way. Another way, you know, instead of saying, well, um, gosh, you should just be grateful for this X, Y, and Z. At least you have this X, Y, and Z, you know, instead of saying, well, what, what about this? You know? Yeah. You know, there are definitely always things that to be grateful for, but it's okay also to be sad about things too, you know, and it's okay to sit in our grief as well. <laughs> Um, so that, that <laughs> one heart, that one mindedness, that like mindedness, that others orientedness is so huge. So that one enemy, one heart and one purpose, one purpose comes from the idea of just really, um, you know, not, not, uh, again, counting whose sacrifice is greater or, you know, stacking things against one another, but, you know, having one purpose to, to, you know, to see normalcy again in a way that is safe for everyone, but in a way that, you know, um, minimizes, um, you know, the, the negative effects too of a stay at home order. So there's, there's so many different moving parts to this. It's a very nuanced, very complex discussion. And I think the humility and the, the grace we have for one another is, is what's really going to move things forward instead of keeping us caught in this kind of trench of fighting against one another. So that's, I think that's what I would, want to want to say is let's let's remember let's remember that that message of one 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 um and then really the best person i think that has said it is mother Teresa. um someone sent me this earlier and i've, I've read this before but it just has taken on a new meaning and in her words she says you know people are often unreasonable irrational and self-centered forgive them anyway if you are kind people may accuse you of selfish ulterior motives be kind anyway if you are successful, you will win some unfaithful friends and some genuine enemies succeed anyway. If you're honest and sincere, people may deceive you. Be honest and sincere anyway. What you spend years creating, others could destroy overnight. Create anyway. The good you do today will often be forgotten. Do good anyway. Give the best you have and it will never be enough. Give your best anyway. In the final analysis, it's between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. Thank you so much. Thank you for all that wisdom, the call to unity, the call to recognize who our true opponent is in all of this and um, how, how rich of an opportunity we have to, to become better neighbors to one another, better friends, better family members. And um, <laughs> in that vein, I'm very, very thankful to your daughter, to your little one, to, to share mommy with me today <laughs> for some time. <laughs> For a long time. Thank you so much. <laughs> Wanna say hi, Lily? Yeah. Hi, Lily. Thank you so much for sharing your mommy. And thank you for sharing her with so many of us. Um, <laughs> so I'll just close out. Thank you to the whole Walton family uh, for sharing joy tonight. And, um, for, and, and to Joy, thank you for taking time tonight to be with me, to share your experience from the heart from your professional expertise, from your spirit, 
Um, and thank you for using intention to shine your light in your corner of the world. So in following the spirit of this conversation, I'm going to have a few links below for people to connect with free compassionate listening with chaplain, pastors, and priests, um, or an in initial consultation if they want uh, counseling opportunities and even a, a, a big directory of therapists who are available in this time to help out, um, as well as an, as, a, as a portal to share prayer requests confidentially if you have that, and, um, and a support self-care group as well. So comment, like, subscribe, connect with me here, and I will continue to give my best to share information for your self-care and protecting your mental health and emotional wellness. God bless, and we'll see you all next time. Thank, Thank you, Joy. You. Bye. Bye.